praise the Lord. I greet you this evening in the exalted name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. You know, truly there is none like him. And I'm happy that he has given us the word of God. Amen. The word of God, the Bible says, is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. He said, where we talk to a young man, cleanse his ways from by taking heed to the word of God. Amen. I'm happy that we have the word of God. And the scripture did say we must study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is one of my favorite scriptures because it means I would have to take time to always ensure that I am in the word and ensure that I am rightly dividing the word of God. Praise God. Tonight we are going to continue our subject that we started last week. We said let's discuss the Sabbath and we set a foundation last week and we looked at a couple things just to set out a good foundation for us to build upon as we go into the New Testament and rightly see what this Sabbath issue is about. Amen? We examine the Genesis account and we realize that in the book of Genesis where the Bible said God rested from the Sabbath. <laughs> uh, better yet, God rested. The scripture never states that he practically kept the Sabbath per se. But what the scripture is practically saying is that God stopped working. He sees to work amen and he stopped working in relation to creation amen we look at the fact that on that particular day he did bless that day he did stop work but there was no commandment given for a man to keep the sabbath we look at the fact that the whole commandment to give the sabbath was first given to israel uh, in exodus 20 and god was reminding them of something that he said to them in exodus chapter 16 when they came out of Egypt and he asked them that they, they asked for bread and God provided the manna from heaven for them. And when they saw the manna from heaven, they, were, uh, they didn't know what it was per se. And God somewhat provided this for them. So this is what God told them to do. They should gather these manna every day. But on the sixth day, they should gather it double time so that they'd have enough to keep them on the seventh day. So this is what God was reminding them of. I will also see in the book of Deuteronomy where God was saying that, look here, one of the reasons for keeping the Sabbath is because I took you out of Egypt as slaves and I brought you and I brought you home, uh, bringing you to a land that I have promised you. So based on this reminder to them, they were to keep the Sabbath. Amen? We look at the law. We look at the different type of covenant and what a covenant is. We said that a covenant is like a contract arrangement. Uh, we did say, for example, that the covenant in our time would be something like the Constitution, the highest law that governed everything else. We look at the fact that there were not only just the Constitution, which is the Ten Commandments, but there was also the 613 commandments that explained, amen, the Ten Commandments. And we look at the fact that the sign of the covenant uh, was the Sabbath. So in the center of the Ten Commandments, what was the sign of this covenant to Israel was the Sabbath. It was a sign because it was special to them. Praise God. And we look at the different type of laws. We realize that there were three types of laws. The moral laws. We said that there was the um, civil laws. And we said that there was the, uh, what was the third one? So it was the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. We did say that these three laws um, were what make up the, what the Jews would have followed. And we did say that the moral laws do not change, and they cannot change. Amen. Today we're going to continue, and um, I want to start with a question that was posted to me, a question that came to me um, while doing the session. Someone uh, saw the Bible study and asked a question as relates to the Sabbath. I did say that the covenant was between God and Israel. Amen. So the question that was asked is this. If the Sabbath was a covenant between God and Israel alone, how do I explain Isaiah chapter 56 verses 2 to 4, which states the stranger, which is the Gentile, should keep the Sabbath? So it was a good question because, I mean, when you look at that particular verse, 
you get the impression that the scripture is clearly stating that Gentiles uh, should keep the Sabbath. But let us look at what Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 2 to 4 says. It says, Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that laid hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that had joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord had utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuch that keep my Sabbath, and show the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. If we go down to verse 6, uh, which is not here, it actually tells us about the strangers also that they should keep uh, the Sabbath. But let us look at it. There must be an explanation for this. So let us look at the explanation. Firstly, Isaiah mentioned two groups of people in that particular verse. He mentions one, the strangers, who were obviously Gentiles. And secondly, he mentions the eunuch. Now there's a similarity between these two groups of persons. One, the eunuch and the Gentiles were excluded from entering the tabernacle. Amen. So what was applied to the eunuch was applied also to the stranger, which is a Gentile. Neither of these persons were allowed uh, to enter into the tabernacle. However, because they were under the Israeli covenant, or the covenant that was given to Israel, they were required to keep the Sabbath. So let's just move to the other point. Did God, and, I, and normally Jesus would do something like this. Sometimes, you know, to answer a question. They say you can't answer a question with a question, but sometimes it can be done. So did God impose a Sabbath on the Gentiles? No. And that's a sounding no. He imposed a law on anyone that was supposed to be a part of the Sinai covenant. So God did not impose the Sabbath on anybody else but Israel. Amen. Or anybody who would be a part of the Sinai covenant. Another question. Could Gentiles join themselves to Israel? Now this is where the point comes in. And that answer is yes. So a Gentile could become a part of the covenant. So in Isaiah's day, what happened is that if a Gentile wanted to be a part of the covenant, or he wanted to become a Jew, he had to enter in under the terms of the covenant. And one of the terms of the covenant is that he had to be circumcised. The second thing is that he had to keep the Sabbath. So here is the big point in all of what Isaiah was practically saying. And I'm answering the question in Isaiah chapter 56. The point is that Gentiles were permitted to become part of Israel. And it was Israel that was required to keep the Sabbath. Let me say that again. The Gentiles were permitted to become a part of Israel. In other words, when they came out of Israel, there were actually strangers that came out with them. And in order for them to be a part of the Israeli covenant, they had to be circumcised and they, had to, they were called proselytes. They had to keep uh, the laws of Israel because they were now under the covenant of Israel. Amen. So Gentiles can become a part of the covenant by becoming a part of Israel. And if you become a part of Israel, then as Israel, you are required to keep the Sabbath. So when this Bible said there were strangers there, we talk about strangers that joined themselves to the Lord. In other words, strangers that became a part of the Israeli covenant uh, were required to keep the Sabbath, not Gentile nations on a whole. And I hope that answered the person's question that they asked. Now, let us move to, we did promise that this week we are going to move into the Sabbath into the New Testament. Amen. So we're moving on to the whole Sabbath in the New Testament now. We have looked at the Old Testament. We have set out some things in the Old Testament and we, re we set the foundation. Now, let us look at the Sabbath in the New Testament, which we are a part of. In our examination of the New Testament, we are going to examine two main characters, two persons that I find um, that were very profound in bringing across this very clearly to us. The first person is Jesus, obviously because he is uh, 
the due covenant in itself. Amen. Everything is fulfilled in him. So it's important that we get to understand what he has to say as it relates to the Sabbath. The second person is the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. And it's not that others didn't write about it. And I could have gone into what James says and what John says. But I think the Apostle Paul did a very good job in dealing especially with the Judaizers of his days. And because he had to deal with the Judaizers, he obviously wrote a lot of things about the old covenant versus the new covenant. So let us look at what Jesus had to say about the Sabbath. Praise God. So Jesus and the Sabbath. Now let me first remind you that Jesus, as he stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, um, there appeared to him two persons, and we did speak about this last week, Moses and Elijah. We say that the sum of the Old Testament revelation came to me with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. And we did say that Moses, which came there, represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets. And there's a term that is used even in scripture to refer to the Old Testament. It's called the law and the prophets. So the sum of the Old Testament came to meet with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5 to 9, it says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the clouds which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear he him. And when the disciples heard it, praise God, the Bible said, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. This is the talking about the Mount of Transfiguration experience. While he was there, Elijah and Moses came. But here it is that Peter got excited that he wanted to build three tabernacles for all of them. And in the midst of that, while he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a, a voice came out of cloud said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. In other words, Moses was there. Elijah was there. But the voice didn't say, listen to Moses or listen to Elijah. It says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. If you want to hear what this new covenant is about, Jesus is the summation of the full covenant. We want to hear what everything that was pointed to him is about. Hear him. And I like the fact that when Jesus taught the disciples because they were so afraid, they saw nobody else but Jesus. In other words, in order for us to understand this new covenant, we can't see anybody else but Jesus. We need to understand Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that Moses and Elijah represented. Now, there's a scripture moving on, so we're going to hear what Jesus has to say. And this is important for us. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now, I've learned from biblical hermeneutics that we don't just read scriptures in there in a vacuum. We try to get a background behind what the scripture is actually saying. So we read the scriptures and I'm telling you that Jesus was speaking. And he's saying that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Who was he addressing? What was he talking about? Let us get a background behind what is taking place here. Let's move back up a few verses. In Mark chapter 2, verse 23 to 24, it says, Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of the grain. And the Pharisees said unto him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on 
the Sabbath. So here we see that, and if you read the verses, even above, it talk about two stories. It, the, Jesus wants to bring out the point that he is Lord of Lords. Amen. So if you read the earlier voice, the earlier verses, you're talking about him healing a man that was paralyzed and he was brought down into his house and, and he healed him and the disciples were wondering, you know. And he did make a point. He said, instead of healing the man, he said, boy, your sins be forgiven thee. And the, disciples, and, 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 the, and the Pharisees that were there were practically confused because they were saying in their mind, how is it that Jesus is saying that thy sins be forgiven thee? And Jesus discerned them. And Jesus said, what is better to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee or take up your bed and walk. All right then, take up your bed and walk. And the man took up his bed and they were astonished because he was showing them that he was Lord over everything. Later on, he sat and he called Levi, amen, who was the tax collector. And the Bible said that he was in his house and they, and they came to him and they were eating with the sinners. And the Pharisees again, apparently they love to show up where Jesus is. They saw Jesus sitting there and they said to him, how is it that you're eating with the sinners and so on and so forth? And he went on to say, boy, he that is righteous don't need a doctor, practically. He that is whole don't need a doctor. The sick need a doctor. And he brought because he is Lord over everything. So in a similar case, we came down no further now, and he's now walking with his disciples on the Sabbath day. And he's practically, they practically pluck heads of the green. And again, who show up? The Pharisees. And they look and they say, why is it not lawful for your disciples to be eating or plucking grains on the Sabbath? So the, the Pharisees accused Jesus and his disciples for breaking the Sabbath by plucking heads of grains of corn on the Sabbath day. Now you want to understand that the Pharisees established 39 categories of actions that were forbidden on the Sabbath. And this was based on their particular interpretation of the laws and of the Jewish customs. So it wasn't a case just only by that they read in the law. They made up their own thing. They made themselves Lord of the Sabbath by establishing their own type of covenant. The breaking of the grain of corn and to rub it in their hand was considered as harvesting. But disciples were very hungry. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 1, that same account, Matthew brought up the fact that the disciples were hungry. But yet still, the Pharisees did not see that. The Pharisees accused Jesus and his disciples for breaking the Sabbath. But I like Jesus' response. I like Jesus' response by bringing out two principles. Firstly, he spoke about what David did with the holy bread in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 1 to 6. And I, it is it's important that if you have a Bible, you could go back and you can read that. But what exactly happened there was that every week they would have 12 consecrated bread that were called they were called the bread of presents and they were placed in the table in the tabernacle they were placed on a table in the tabernacle at the end of the day the ones that were not used were supposed to be eaten by the priests that worked in the tabernacle now this scripture in first samuel chapter 21 and verse 1 to 6 spoke about something David was running for his life. He was running from Saul. He and his men. And it so happened that they got hungry. And they went to the tabernacle. And the priest that was there gave them the bread to eat. So the very priest understood. And guess what happened? God did not punish them for eating the bread. Because they were hungry. So here is the principle that God wanted to bring out to these Pharisees. The principle was that human need 
is more important than a religious ritual or a ceremonial law. So in this case, they were allowed to break any ceremonial ritual they have or any ceremonial law because the need was greater than the law. The Sabbath was meant to serve man. He wanted them to get that. Because the Sabbath was made for man. It was made to serve the man. And not the man to serve the Sabbath. Hope you get that. So if they are hungry at the end of the day, they should be fed. What was more important? In God's eyes, mercy was before sacrifice. And that is in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. In God's eyes, love for others superseded any rit religious ritual. And that's what God wanted them to understand. So the Sabbath was made, and, and, and this is very important, the Sabbath was made to benefit Israel by providing them a day of rest. Every day, they would have worked, 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 but God is saying, look here, on this particular day, I want you to not work. I want to give you rest from your work, your physical work. And I want to highlight that point. It was rest from physical work. It was not created to impose impossible restrictions and burdens. And so this was the first point, as we said before. God brought up the principle that the human need is more important than the religious need. But let us move to another point. The second principle was that the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. He said that. What Jesus was saying is that he is, is master even of the Sabbath. So by this Jesus was openly saying to the Pharisees that he is greater and above the law. And can we establish the fact that the creator is always greater than the creation. This must have puzzled them. Because as I said before, the Pharisees made their own interpretation of how to keep the Sabbath. And they added their, the law and their religious rituals and their Jewish customs together to say that this is what you need to do. But Jesus said, look here man, I, the son of man, is the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, I am the master of this thing. I am the one that created it. And because I am the creator, I am greater than the creation. And therefore, he superseded anything that the Pharisees actually came with. Jesus also made the point that the Sabbath was not a moral absolute. And this is very important because when you talk about a moral absolute, what am I saying is that it cannot be broken. For example, we spoke about the moral laws and we say that the moral laws can be broken, cannot be broken. Because if you break the moral law, it's an attack on God, which cannot be changed. God is immutable. He cannot change. So in a similar sense, God, Jesus brought the point clearly that the Sabbath was not a moral absolute, which cannot be broken. So in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 5, Jesus said this, Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, my God, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Now how did the priests profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Let me tell you what happened. The priests had to perform their religious duties. And they even had to work twice as much on the Sabbath day. Can you believe that? So while all Israel rested on the seventh day, the priests performed the Sabbath day. And guess what? This was allowed. So if the Sabbath was a moral absolute, then it would have included everybody. But the priests 
while everybody had to stay home and they had to rest from their work, the priests did twice as much work. And while they were doing more work in the tabernacle on the Sabbath, which the scripture said they profaned the Sabbath, or profaned the Sabbath, guess what? They were still blameless because they were doing what they were supposed to do. And I'm going to come back to this point. The next thing is that crisis took precedence over the Sabbath. Jesus said that too. So the Sabbath was allowed to be broken if there was an emergency. And Jesus reminded the Pharisees of this also. He says, and he said unto them, What man shall, be, shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it? And lift it out. In other words, there was a crisis. There's an emergency. Your sheep fell over a cliff, fell into something, to a pit. You're going to let him stay there and die? If there's a case of life and death, you have to choose life. So he had to save the sheep. But guess what? Why is that a problem? Because on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to be a burden, you're not supposed to lift anything. But guess what? If your sheep falls into a pit, you have to take him out. So crisis took precedence over the Sabbath. This, this is what Jesus is saying. Now. These are all Jesus is saying. Look at this one also. Look at the Sabbath and circumcision. The Sabbath day also had to take a second place to circumcision. Which had to happen on the eighth day of a child's life. So if a child was born and his eighth day came on the Sabbath, do you think the priest was going to say, oh, it's the Sabbath, so I am going to not allow uh, this guy to be circumcised. Let me circumcise him on the ninth day. Because the eighth day is the Sabbath. No! Look at what Jesus says. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, and you are angry at me because I had made a man every week whole on the Sabbath day. In other words, Jesus is comparing what he did and saying that what I did is far superior to keeping the Sabbath. In the same way that they had to circumcise the child on the eighth day even if it was the Sabbath. I know why. First of all, for you to enter into the covenant you had to be circumcised. So because you had to be circumcised to enter the covenant, it was far superior than the sign of the covenant. <laughs> ah, boy. So based on the few examples that we see, let us jump back to the question I asked last week. The Sabbath, is it a moral law or is it a ceremonial law? Look at all the examples I brought out. The disciples ate corn, pluck it, when they consider harvesting, because they were hungry. Hmm? We saw that. The Sabbath is not a moral absolute, because the priest could work. Hmm? And because the priest could work, it means that if it was a moral absolute, then the priest could not work. Thirdly, Crisis superseded the Sabbath. Fourthly, circumcision was higher than the Sabbath. You know how I know that the Sabbath could not be a moral law? Because while Jesus allowed the disciples to pluck corn, which is a breaking of the Sabbath, or allowed people to pull out a sheep if he fell into a hole, hmm? Jesus would never allow his disciples to commit fornication and say, okay, because he's higher than this. Because he cannot change. That is moral. And God can't go against who he is. But because the Sabbath was not a moral law. But a ceremonial law. Which I'm putting to you today. It could have been broken. The Sabbath could have been broken. Because it pointed to something bigger. Than just resting on the seventh day. The Sabbath could be broken. Because the seventh day Sabbath. Was really just something that would have pointed to who Jesus is. And we're going to look at that. 
Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 18. Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I see that term law and prophets again. Law, Moses, prophets, Elijah. Him don't come to destroy what was there. I'm not come to destroy it, but I am come to fulfill it. The word fulfill mean there, it actually is going to make it full. Uh, what it represented is going to come out in him. Everything that it was supposed to be, or what God intended it for it to be, is going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And therefore, that is why it was allowed to be broken by the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, when the scripture said that they broke the Sabbath, it wasn't that they broke Sabbaths that were instituted by uh, the laws that were just instituted by the, 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 the Pharisees. He broke the Sabbath. And they broke the Sabbath because it pointed to something that was bigger than them. So Jesus didn't come to break or to abolish the law and the prophets. He come to fulfill them. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets because they point to him and he is their fulfillment. And this is based on a theologian. I like that quote. Let me quote again. First quote. Jesus fulfills the laws and the prophets. Why? Because they point to him and he is their fulfillment. So as a human that didn't sin, he fulfilled the moral requirements of the law. As the one who bore our sins in our body, in his body on the cross, he fulfilled the civil law. Remember the civil law was practically what should you get for committing this particular sin. And Jesus said, okay, he bore our sins in his body. And by doing that on the cross, he fulfilled the civil laws. And as the supreme sacrifice of all the types and shadows, he fulfilled the ceremonial law. My God. In order for us to get to see what the Sabbath and the law point to, let us look at how the Apostle Paul viewed the law and the Sabbath. Because now we get Jesus is saying that he didn't come to, to, to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Let us look at what the Apostle Paul now has to say with this. Because now we're going to put what Jesus has to say. We get what Jesus is saying now. Jesus is saying you can break them because, look here, they, they, they practically just point to him. They are not a moral law, but they are ceremonial laws which can be broken because they really for specific reasons because they point to him and they are going to be fulfilled in him let us look at what the apostle paul view now i like the apostle paul and we just going to take out a few examples of what he has to say amen first of all remember who the apostle paul was he sat at the feet of gamaliel he was a pharisee of a pharisee if a man that understood anything about the old testament laws it would have been Paul. He was a brilliant man. He was not a novice. But he had an issue. If you can remember, at one point in time, there was an issue in the church. I think it was in Antioch. Where the Judaizers would come down. And when I use the term Judaizers, the Judaizers are Christians, are Jews who were converted to Christianity. Right? So the Judaizers came into the church and they were telling the Gentiles that in order for them to be saved, they had to keep the laws of Moses. He was saying to them, look here, in order for you to be saved, you must keep the laws of Moses. And it created a big stir in the church in Antioch. There was a whole lot of problems. Can you imagine? These men were so convinced of the law that even after getting saved, they wanted to go back into doing the mosaic rituals. And they're saying that, oh, we believe the things that you told us in Christ, but we must, in order for us to be saved, we must also still keep the Sabbath. We must be circumcised. We must keep the feast days. We must keep these things. I remember what happened. Paul left 
Antioch and he went up to Jerusalem and he met with the disciples and he brought the issue about these Judaizers. And they came to a conclusion that, look here, let us not try to put no burden on the Gentiles. In other words, don't put no yoke around them neck we ourselves cannot keep. And he gave them practically three things, I think in Acts chapter 15. That they must abstain from fornication and things strangled and blood and things that offer to idols and so on and so forth. Let us not try to put more on them. There was nothing there in that law that actually says that they must keep the Sabbath. And there was a reason. They were Gentiles. They were, they were people that came in now under the church. They were used to doing uh, their Gentile pagan rituals, which was practically um, offering to idols strangling blood and so on and, and fornication this was a normal thing in gentile pagan world so the apostles under the holy ghost say let us not try to put no burden on them about keeping the laws of moses because we ourselves couldn't even keep it but let us try to tell them to do these three things and the bible said letters were sent to all the churches stating that so paul was a man of authority and could speak clearly about what the church should or should not do. So here it is that he's writing to the church in Colossians. Amen. And he is bringing out a pattern to them. As we said before, he was a Jewish scholar. He understand the Hebrew writings. He's known he was a scholar. He, he, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, as I said. So here it is that Paul is saying to them in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let me tell you one of the things that I have realized from this verse. Because I have, and, and many apostolics will bring this verse to Sabbath keepers who say, look here, but this is the verse we know. Colossians 2 say, don't judge me in meat or drink or holy day or new moon or Sabbath days. And what the first time I brought this scripture to a good friend of mine, the person said to me, don't you realize that the Sabbath day is there? So he's talking about the... The, not the weekly Sabbath, but it's talking about the, 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 the first day Sabbath or the, 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 the big Sabbath, the, the 50 day Sabbath, the day of Jubilee. He's not talking about the seventh day Sabbath. But as I did more studies on this, and I could not answer at the time, but as I did more studies on this, I realized that there's a problem with saying that. Many have argued, as I said before, that the term Sabbath days here does not refer to the weekly Sabbath, but to other special Sabbaths that Israel would observe. Because I know it was not only the Sabbath day. And most people, when they talk about keeping the Sabbath day, they're not talking about the special Sabbath. They're talking about the weekly Sabbath. And they're saying that this scripture is not talking about the weekly Sabbath, but it's talking about the special Sabbath. But let us examine that argument first of all the Greek word used for Sabbath days is the is the word Sabbaton so in Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 to 17 the Greek word used for Sabbath days is Sabbaton and every time that word in the New Testament is used it's always in reference to the seventh day Sabbath Actually, it occurs 68 times in 62 verses. And it is always in reference to the seventh day of each week. So you're telling me now that for the 68 times, there's one exception? I don't think so. The word Sabbaton, every time it's used, it's always used in reference to the weekly Sabbath and not any other Sabbath. Let's look at some example. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, And at the time Jesus went on 
went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were and hung God. Remember that scripture we just talked about a while ago? And he began to pluck the ears of the corn and to eat. That word Sabbath day again is Sabbaton. And obviously the context here speaks to the seventh day Sabbath. All Bible scholars would agree with that. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8, praise God. The Bible says, for the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. Again, the Greek there is the word Sabbaton. And in that context, speak to any Adventist, speaks to any seven-day Baptist, any seven-day church of God. They will tell you that the word Sabbath here is making reference to the seven-day Sabbath, Sabbaton. Look at one more example. In St. John chapter 9 and verse 14, he said, And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Again, we are seeing the word Sabbaton. So all the times, and there are many, as we said before, there are 68 times that we are seeing that word Sabbaton in the New Testament. 68 times in 62 verses. And every time it uses the term Sabbaton, it's always in reference to the seventh day. But if you're not convinced, let us move further on and look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. Paul, as I said before, was very familiar with the Old Testament. He was familiar with Hebraic patterns. He was familiar with how they would display the festivals, the new moons, the Sabbaths. And he used that same principle in his writings. The pattern was like this. It was either years to months to days. And days here speaks to from week to week. Or it was reverse from days to months to years. So one way it either go from years to months to days. I'm going to say before, in the context of days, talking about from every week, weekly. It could be years to month to weekly, if you want to put it like that. And then the other way was the reverse of that, which is days to months to years. That was a pattern that, that was used in the Old Testament. Let's just look at some examples. First of all, let's just look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 again, just to make the point. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, talking about food or feasts food or of a holy day holy day were yearly celebrations or of the new moon the new moon were monthly celebrations or of the sabbath days which is a weekly celebrations so paul was using the principle of the old testament yearly monthly then weekly don't believe me? Let us move to some scriptures to bring up that point. In Ezekiel chapter 45 and verse 17, it says, And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offering and meat offering and drink offering. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. We see that there in purple. Go on to say, In feast. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. Or of holy days. Then they go on to say, and in the new moons. And in the Sabbath. The same principle is brought out here. Just like the scripture in Colossians chapter 2. We see meat and drink. We see the holy days. Which is the feast. We see the new moons, which is the monthly, and in the Sabbath, which is the weekly. It's a principle in the Old Testament. Let's look again at scripture in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 11. He said, I will also cause all their mirth to cease. Her feast, which is yearly, her new moons, which is monthly, and her Sabbaths, which is daily, and all her solemn feasts. 
So the principle is brought out clearly. Let us look at a chart and put these two together. This is the pattern. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, you're talking about meat or drink. You're talking about yearly, holy day. You talk about monthly, which is new moon, or weekly, which is the Sabbath days. When we put that beside Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 17, and Hosea chapter 2, verse 11, we see a similar pattern. The food is the meat and the drink in Colossians chapter 2. It's the burnt offerings, the meat offerings, and the drink offerings in Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 17. The pattern, the yearly, which is the next step, is the holy day in Colossians chapter 2. It is the feast in Ezekiel chapter 45 verse 17. And it is the feast in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 11. Then we go down to monthly. It's the new moon in Colossians chapter 2 verse 16. It is the new moons in Ezekiel chapter 45 and verse 17. And it is the new moons in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 17. And we go right down to weekly. The Sabbath days. Which is the Sabbath in Ezekiel 45 and the Sabbath in Hosea chapter 2. So there is a consistent pattern of the feast and Sabbath. So to tell me that this verse does throw it out and say it's not the weekly Sabbath, you don't understand Hebrew writing. And Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And therefore he wrote that particular way. But guess what? There is also a way times where Paul would do the reverse. Remember I said before it's either from yearly to monthly to weekly or weekly which is the weekly Sabbath to monthly to yearly. So Paul sometimes switched the pattern too just like they would do it in the Old Testament. And Paul was writing to the church in Galatia and he said in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 10 he observed days and months and times and years. He was bringing out the same pattern. Days and months and times and years. He was bringing out the same type of pattern that we find in the Old Testament. No, it was reversed. Let us look at this reverse pattern in the Old Testament now. In 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 3, he said for the Sabbaths, and for the new moons and for the set feasts as it is written in the law of the Lord. The Sabbath now is weekly, the new moons is monthly, and the set feast is yearly. You see the reverse of the pattern. And Paul used the same principle to bring out the fact that when he was saying, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of new moons or of the sabbath day he was bringing out not the weekly not the yearly sabbaths or the special sabbaths but he was talking about the weekly sabbath like all example let me show you two in second chronicles chapter 31 and verse 3 well this was the same example for the sabbaths and for the new moons and for the set feasts amen but why did Paul write this? Why do you think Paul write it like this? As I said before, Judaizers in the first century were telling the Colossian Christians that they must follow special rituals and rules and regulations in order to be saved. Amen? And these things that he was talking about, Paul talked about them. The dietary law, which is where you eat, the holidays and feast days, which is the yearly things, the new moons, which is the monthly things, and the Sabbath day. But Paul made a very important point. He never just said, let no man therefore judge you in these things, you know. Him tell us why. Paul gave the answer. Him said, they were a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. So, let no man therefore judge you in the dietary restrictions, in the holidays and are the holidays and the feast days, in the new moons 
are in the weekly Sabbaths. Why? Because they were simply a shadow of things to come. Now, some persons probably is the first time you're hearing this term Sabbath, or hearing the term shadow, I should say. So let me define the term before we move on. The word shadow, as used in Colossians, is from the Greek word skia, and it speaks to a shade, speaks to a sketch or an outline. In other words, it is like the sun shining and you're seeing a reflection. Not, not, well, not wouldn't be a reflection. See a shape of yourself on the earth. That is what the dietary laws were. That is what the, 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 the feasts were. That is what the new moon was. That is what the Sabbath day was. They were just simply a sketch. They were simply an outline. They were simply just a shade. But I like how Paul put it. He said, but the body now is of Christ. You see the word body there, as used in Colossians, is from the Greek word soma. And it means the reality or the substance. My God. So nobody is supposed to judge you in these things. Because what they had in the Old Testament was just the shadow. But what we have is the substance. So for example, as I said before, Jesus fulfilled, for example, the feast of the Passover. Because every Passover, they would have offered a lamb. And that lamb would be killed. That lamb would be place on the burnt offer, uh, burnt altar. And but what they were doing, they were doing daily, daily, daily. But Jesus is the fulfillment. It pointed to Jesus. Amen. And because it pointed to Jesus, when John saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So he became the Passover. They had to celebrate the feast of first fruits. Jesus is the first fruit of them that slept. So in the first food, whatever they had to do, Jesus rose from the dead to prove that point. He fulfilled all of these feasts. In a similar way, Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath. It was just a shadow. It was just a representation. It was just a sketch. It was just an outline of what Jesus was about to do. Now you really can't touch the Sabbath unless you go to the church of Galatia because they had a big issue so let's look at the church of Galatia to show the real substance the Jewish Christians entered the church and was teaching that Christians was returned to the laws of Moses to be saved but Paul make a point and say are you so foolish and that's what I'm going to say to somebody. When you think that you can go back and observe the old rituals and think that it can be saved, I take the same words of Paul. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You know why? Because everything in the law required work, fleshly. <laughs> but when it comes out to this new covenant it requires spirit it's the spirit of God that changes you so, so how are you so foolish you start out good you get the Holy Ghost you start it in the spirit and here it is that these Jewish Judaizers came in and are now making you perfect in the flesh Paul was upset and declared that they have returned to the weekly and beggarly elements. We are to desire again to be in bondage. He said you observe days and months and times and years. Now we said before, this is a reverse. Days talking about the Sabbath days. He said, I am afraid of you. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. 
How is it that you get the real thing? And I'm going to tell you what the real thing. Don't worry, I'm going there. How is it that you get this real thing? But yet still, you're going back to the weak and beggarly elements wherein you desire again to be in bondage. That's the question Paul was answering, asking them. And I'm telling them why I'm saying you observe days and months and times and years. I'm saying, look here, man, because of what you're doing, me, Paul. And Paul was a Jew of a Jew. Paul said, I'm afraid of you. Now, let me tell you how Paul dealt with the issue in Galatians. He brought out an allegory. And we're going to read that in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 31. So that we can fully understand the verse. And then we can exegete. Exegete means we're pulling out the intended meaning out of what Paul was trying to say to them. We're going to get what Paul was trying to convey to the church in Galatia. They already were made, started in the spirit. And because of the entrance of the Judaizers, as the scripture said, they are made now, making perfect in the flesh. So Paul had to use what they know so that they could understand what they have in Christ. And I pray God that those of us who are listening tonight might begin to understand what we have in Christ Jesus. Some of us leave the apostolic church because we don't understand what we really have. And we say we're going to join to this and that and we're going to start this and we're going to... We come like the Judaizers. We start imposing some of the laws of Moses back into the church. Mm -mm. We have a liberty in Christ. So, because I don't want us to miss this point, I'm going to read in its entirety Galatians chapter 4 from verse 21 to 31. Ten verses. It says, Tell me, he that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. <laughs> but he of the free woman was by promise. I like that. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendered to bondage, which is Agar. Moving on. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And answer it to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate had many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Like that. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Paul is making reference to the Judaizers who come in and causing havoc of those who are of the spirit. He said, nevertheless, what say the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be here with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. My God. Let us try to break this down a little bit. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 30, 31, we saw two sons. We saw Ishmael and we saw Isaac. We saw two mothers. We saw Hagar. We saw Sarah. We saw that the two mothers were linked to two covenants. The old covenant and the new covenant. And the two covenants were going to be established in two areas. One was established at Mount Sinai. And one was going to be established in Jerusalem. Now let us look at the 
let us look back at the two sons what do we know of Ishmael as opposed to what do we know of Isaac Ishmael was born out of works it was a human attempt to bring about to fulfill the promise of God in other words in order for Ishmael to come on the scene it took they were trying to help God it took their effort they tried to do what they had to do but God never liked that notice they had the same father Ishmael and Isaac because the two covenants come from the same God help me Holy Ghost but Ishmael was birthed out of the fact that Abraham went in unto Isaac trying to fulfill the promise of God which he could not have done Hagar which he could not have done on the other hand as it relates to Isaac which is the son of the promise there is nothing that he could have done to bring that Isaac into place it took all God in a similar way with the old covenant with the old covenant what we find is that people try to live up to the law you try to follow the law to the T to be righteous but guess what happened in the new covenant our righteousness is not of us is of Christ and because Christ comes to live in us we can know live this is nothing that we can do as a matter of fact the old covenant they try to follow it and all their righteousness the Bible described as filthy rags when the Bible said their righteousness is as filthy rags talking about you attempt to bring across the promises of God but the new covenant only one person could be righteous hallelujah and that was Jesus and therefore our righteousness is not of ourselves but it's of him Lord also the two areas the first covenant came at Sinai and it was written on tables of stone so you followed the external things that Moses brought before them. But the new covenant came at Jerusalem. Where now the writing was no longer on tables of stone external. But the writing is now on our hearts. The Holy Ghost. My God. So by the allegory used by Paul. Paul wanted us. To understand that what we have under the covenant of grace is greater than what they have under the law to the point where Paul brought out some notable things look what Paul said in 2nd Corinthians chapter 3 verse 68 who also had made us able ministers of the new testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter killeth but the spirit giveth light but if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones were glorious because when they got the ten command it was a glorious event it was magnificent you saw the presence of god it was thunder and lightning upon the mountain so much so that the children of israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance which glory was to be done away with how shall the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious because now when Moses got the covenant it shone on his face can you imagine when you get the Holy Ghost it was written on tables of stone and it's about to be faded away how shall the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 it says a new covenant 
he had made the first hole. Now that which is decayed and waxed old is ready to vanish away. We get better things than them. Now let us let, let us just show the contrast. And this is where I want to bring out the point about this, what the Sabbath is. In the old covenant of the Sabbath, it was given 50 days after the Passover on Mount Sinai on tables of stone. So when God told the children of Israel to kill that Passover lamb, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 50 days after this event, Moses was at Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments on tables of stone. But guess what? In the new covenant, and that was the Sabbath, the physical rest. In the new covenant, 50 days Jesus died. After Jesus died in Jerusalem, we got the Holy Ghost. No longer was it now on tables of stone as before. But the Holy Ghost is now inside, written on our hearts. That is why we have better things. The Sabbath was a physical rest from work. My God. But God shows that the new covenant is bigger. Because while God gave them a rest from physical work, what God really wanted to do was give us a spiritual rest from sin. So the Holy Ghost, the old covenant was just a physical rest from physical work. Every seventh day, they would rest. Every seventh day, they work up to the sixth day and they rest on the seventh day. But when you get the Holy Ghost, my God, you rest from sin. And let me tell you why I know you rest from sin. The Bible is clear in St. John that he that worketh receiveth wages and getteth fruit unto life eternal. So it's when you work, you receive wages. Then the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 26, that the wages of sin is death. In other words, for all your working that you have worked in sin, your only payment for that is death. But guess what? When you get the Holy Ghost, you get a spiritual rest. Just like when they had a physical rest from physical work, when you get the Holy Ghost, you get a spiritual rest for no longer you have to toil in sin which only produces death the sabbath was the sign of the old covenant it is what distinguished you from uh, distinguished israel from the other nations they had to keep the sabbath and when the sabbath was a physical sign that they had to do the holy ghost when you get the holy ghost my god it's the sign of the new covenant. By this seal, Halagula Hadabasata, the Lord knoweth them that are his. When you get the Holy Ghost, brethren, what you get is God coming to live inside of you. That is the sign. No wonder the Bible says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Just like oh, if a man didn't keep the Sabbath in the Old Testament, you, you, you could say he was not a part of the Sinai covenant, which was the sign of the covenant. It was a sign that you are keeping the Mosaic covenant. In a similar way, when you get the Holy Ghost and power, it's a sign that you are a part of the new covenant. Last contrast is that the Sabbath was external. But the Holy Ghost is internal. So the Bible said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 that Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law. I like that. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. Christ did not redeem us from the law, He redeemed us from the curse of the law. What was the curse of the law, brethren? The curse of the law is that it can tell us what sin is, but it cannot stop us from wanting to sin. So basically, the old covenant was limited. It was a set of rules that you must keep that were external, outside of the grasp of the people. But guess what happened? When you get the Holy Ghost, 
my God. It changes your very desire. Because your spirit is once again enlightened. You are connected to the righteous one. And by his strength, you can become righteous. Your righteousness is not of yourselves. Your righteousness is of God. That's what the apostle was talking about. It's an eternal thing. As a matter of fact, if it was up to you, then when Christ looked at your record, you would have no say. Because all your attempts of keeping everything that was under the law would not be fruition to you. But when Christ looked at your record, he's not seeing you, my God. He's seeing Jesus. That is why you need the Holy Ghost. It's internal affair. And when he sees Jesus, he sees the righteousness Jesus has never sinned. And therefore, for that reason, you can become righteous. I'm going to close with a scripture in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Jesus made a profound statement. And I, persons who are listening today, and if you are not, don't have the Holy Ghost. Jesus said to the Jews, they were already used to keeping the weekly Sabbath. They were very used to, at the end of the week, to actually come and know that they're supposed to rest, not keep a physical Sabbath. But Jesus looked at them and said, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If I was a Jew, I would say, What are you talking about? God has already given us this rest from in the Old Testament. But Jesus, the bigger picture is at hand. What they had was just the shadow. What they had was just the sketch. So Jesus said, look here, come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden. He was talking about the work that you have to do in sin. Sin is a heavy load, you know. When you live in sin, you know, it's hard. Hard work. And Jesus was offering rest that is far superior to the physical rest from work. He said, if you want rest, come. And I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the rest. They labored all week. They were told not to kindle fire. They were told that they had to work the fields. They were told that we were not to bear any burden. They were told that they didn't work. They had to work their animals. They repeated this every week. But yet still Jesus looked at them. Jesus looked at them. And said come unto me. I'm telling somebody today. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. Or in drink. Or in new moon. Or of holiday, or of new moons, or of the Sabbath days. Because these things were just a shadow of things to come. Jesus is saying that you don't have to toil no more in sin. This is what this whole covenant was about. This is what it was pointing to. It was pointing to something bigger. It was pointing to himself, Jesus Christ, who is the true rest. Amen. When you get the Holy Ghost, you get a refreshing for your soul. You get a rest. That, 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 that. And that is why when people get the Holy Ghost, they will tell you they feel light. They feel this lightness. Because the burden, the tile of work. Let me tell you something. If you're working and you're lifting a load and you have it for a good while, sometimes you don't even realize. If you walk with a big bag and you have a bag full of stuff, it's when you put down the bag, Sometimes you realize how heavy the bag was because for some strange reason it, your, your body just feels lighter. Jesus says, come unto me. I'm going to encourage somebody. You need the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're really none of his. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not a part of this new covenant. Amen. And I can't leave without saying that. Look here. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and they got the Holy Ghost for the first time. Amen. And it puzzled the Jews because 
it, it, this was something new for them. And they asked the question in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Men and brethren, because they were convicting their heart after Peter preached and said, this is that, you know, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And the Bible said they were pricking their hearts. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I can't live without telling you this. There's a better rest that we have. We have a better high priest. Because when he, when he, when he offered the sacrifice, he only offered it once. We have a better sacrifice. Because when he offered himself, there's no more need for another sacrifice. That's why Paul had to say, you're foolish. Because you're trying to do something that God has already fulfilled. And because all of these things, we have a better rest in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And they asked Peter, what must we do in Acts chapter 2? And Peter said, repent. I'm telling somebody today, you need to repent. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. God is going to fill you with the Holy Ghost and power. I'm going to encourage somebody that we have a better rest. We have a better rest. The Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, is not required of the New Testament church because while they rested from work on the seventh day, rested from physical work on the seventh day, when they get the Holy Ghost in the new covenant, we rest from sin forevermore. God bless you. Bow my head, bow your heads as I pray. Amen. And before I pray, I want to remind us that there is a book coming out that Pastor Daly, Bishop Daly has written, One Minute to Midnight. Amen. And it's important that you save to get your copy. It's for 2,800, I think it is, Jamaican dollars. Amen. And I, I can tell you that the book is going to be very interesting. It's going to cover all that we want. We, have, we hear about this COVID thing. We hear about what is happening in the world. But trust me, it is not new. Amen. The scripture has really told us these things. And the man of God saw it fit to write it in plain form that we can get an understanding of what is taking place. Closing off the curtain, the curtains on planet Earth. Amen. So you can get yourself ready. And you will hear more about when this book is coming out. I think the launch is sometime the end of this month. And I think the book should be ready. But we will, I guess Bishop Daly will update us probably on Sunday. But get yourselves ready. And get yourselves ready to get a copy. Amen. Also to remind us that on Sunday, there is going to be one service for group three members. Group three members, get yourself ready to come out and have a Holy Ghost feast. Amen. To enjoy this Holy Ghost that we get in this new covenant. So group three members, get yourselves ready for Sunday. One service starts at 10.30. Praise God. God bless you as we bow our heads as I pray. Great God, righteous God, we thank you God for your love. We thank you Jesus that you saw it fit to Give me, Jesus, to give us, Jesus, this new covenant, this new hope in you, this new blessing, oh God, Jesus, this new rest. We thank you, Jesus, that not only that, that you have called us, amen. You said in your words that ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have sent out the word, even that you did while you were here with us, Jesus, that anybody who is weary and heavy laden, that they can come to you and you will give them rest. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the power, for the rest, for the joy. You said that it's, it's not like the old covenant where they quaked, Oh God, and they begged Moses not to speak to them, uh, not to allow you to talk to them, but that you should speak to Moses and he would come. They were afraid. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we, under this covenant, we can come boldly before your throne. 
We thank you, Lord Jesus, that under this new covenant, there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost because we are in your presence, and in your presence, there is fullness of joy. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that everything in the Old Testament is fulfilled in one word, and that is love. That we must love God with all our hearts, and we must love our neighbors as ourselves. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, again, by the Holy Ghost, which is the sign of this new covenant. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this Bible study this evening. And I pray, God, that even those who don't understand God, that you will open their understanding that you did with the apostles in Luke chapter 24, that they may understand the scriptures, that thus it is written, thus it behove Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin be preached in your name among all nations, beginning as you did at Jerusalem. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for what you're about to do in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for even this subject that we have covered uh, God, there is so much to cover as it relates to the Sabbath. But God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for, that, for these two sessions, Jesus, that you have established a covenant that somebody realize that what we have in Christ is far superior. Help us, Lord Jesus, to even take even the words of the Hebrew writers that we have a better covenant, a better high priest, a better Sabbath, a better rest. Help somebody to hold on to that fact and not to go back into the beggarly elements and the worldly things, and the things of the flesh, and the things that require work. Uh, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. We are children of faith through Abraham. Cover every person today, and let your will be done in our lives. God, and if it seed fit, God Jesus, to put in your appearance tonight, help us, Lord Jesus, to be ready, to be ready, to be ready. Pick our hearts, touch our hearts, let the Holy Ghost work upon us, move upon us, cleanse us, wash us, purify us that we might be ready to stand before you, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords the conquering line of the tribe of Judah the Basa, in the name of Jesus, thank you God for what you have done and what you are about to do in Jesus name Amen, praise God I pray God that if you have any questions, Amen that you can write the questions even in the comment section Amen. I, and persons who have sent emails before, I don't have the email address in my head. I think it's faithchapelupcja at gmail.com. You can send your questions in and we will try to address them as best as possible. We will respond to you. We will see the questions and we will respond to you. Any question that relates to the subject area, anything that was not clear to you, send a question to us because our aim really at the end of the day is to rightly divide God's word of truth. God bless you. Go with God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.